This week's number one. It's the one year anniversary of Prop G Markets. Similar to my first newborn that I had out of wedlock when I was a very young man, I'm hoping that at some point I too can sell this for a new car. Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing inflation's cool down, Sam Altman's SPAC, and private equity's interest in plumbing. Here with the news is Prop G media analyst Ed Elson. Ed, what is a good word? Where are you? I'm in New York. We're having drinks tonight, Scott. Oh, I knew that. I'm excited about it. <laughs> you um, seem very excited. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think. Wait, before or after the prostitute? Yeah, I've got it on my calendar. Hold on. Yeah. Yep, yep. Good, 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 good. Yeah, Where are we it's going? Work out. Where are we going? Uh, I think you're taking us to, I mean, shouldn't you know the answer? I guess here at MJ mm, would know the answer. I think we're going no. to the Equinox. Um, they have like some bar in Midtown. We're going to the gym. We're going to a gym with a bunch of hot I gay guys. I think that's right. I think we're I'm going so to progressive. an Equinox bar. That's right. What's it called? The Claire Electric Lemon? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, electric. That's, you know, that's interesting. That's all right. That's my favorite brand of edibles. Hmm. Nice. Um, that and Gorilla Panic, <laughs> and they're coming, they're coming. <laughs> Those are my favorite because I, I like the stuff that makes you paranoid. Uh, all right, so what are the headlines, Ed? <laughs> uh, let's start with our weekly review of market vitals. The S&P gained, as did Bitcoin. Meanwhile, the dollar fell, as did Treasury yields. Shifting to the headlines. More than 150,000 TV and movie actors are striking, along with the screenwriters whose efforts we covered on a previous episode. This marks Hollywood's first industry-wide shutdown in more than 60 years. A federal judge denied the FTC's attempt to block Microsoft's $70 billion purchase of Activision Blizzard. The FTC says it plans to appeal, but if the deal goes through, it will be the largest tech acquisition ever. Disney extended its contract with CEO Bob Iger for another two years through 2026. That kicks its succession plan further down the road and shares rose 1% on the news. Elon Musk launched an artificial intelligence company, XAI, stating that its goal is to, quote, understand the true nature of the universe. And finally, Meta's threads, which we discussed last week, reached 100 million users in just five days. According to data from web analytics firm SimilarWeb, Traffic at Twitter was down 5% in the first two days after the Threads launch, and it's down 11% from the same time last year. Scott, reactions? Uh, Meta's Threats is a phenomenon. I think we talked, I don't know if we talked about this last week. It's, gonna, it's the yeah, most ascendant platform in history, and I think that probably within 30 days, it's going to have a greater revenue run rate than, um, than Twitter. I think the opportunity here, the Meta opportunity for Meta, is to recast themselves as the good guys. Mm hmm and that is to become go from Darth Vader back to Anakin and, and deploy age verification, err on the side of content moderation. People accuse us of... Whenever anyone's talking about censorship, it's usually a plea for their misinformation to take precedence over other people's misinformation. But I think it's a big opportunity. A bigger opportunity for Meta is to try and do pull a Microsoft and go from being Darth Vader to Anakin. Do you uh, think they start running ads soon? Yeah, they'll that. turn it on. Yeah, and yeah. they have great advertiser relationships. Their advertisers trust them. The a advertisers trust them, but just not parents or, or, you know, or people in government that trust Meta. But advertisers trust Meta. They do a really good job with ad dollars. It's a really – it's a fantastic platform, great ad tech stack. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by this thing. It just strikes me that you know, only – only Elon Musk could have um, starched the hat of Mark Zuckerberg white. He just unintentionally made Mark Zuckerberg a lot less unlikable. Mm -hmm. um, the artificial intelligence company XAI, I think anytime Elon Musk does anything, you have to take it seriously because he'll bring so much attention to it by mm -hmm. virtue of who he is. And he's obviously a, a brilliant visionary. Um, the statement, which I thought was uh, also quintessential Elon, was just so oxymoronic and contradictory. He says that its goal is to understand the true nature of the universe. And then the next statement was, I think, that existing AI is too woke. It's like, well, boss, okay, maybe the universe 
has decided that is the truth. I mean, it's like a claiming to be the pursuit of truth mm-hmm. means you're open to finding out ideas and that you don't know the truth if you're pursuing it. And it's then so to dumb. state that everything is too, it's just, li- li- it's let me contradict what I just said. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to pursue the truth, but I think, but I'm going to try and train this thing to pursue my version of the truth. I just don't, I don't get it. Yeah. But. He also said, he said, well, first he said, if I could press pause on AI or advanced AI, I would. But then he said, it doesn't seem like that's realistic. And then he said, he said he wants to, quote, grow AI in a good way to be, quote, maximally curious and maximally truth seeking. And the thing I was thinking when he said that, it's like, imagine if you walked into a pitch meeting with a VC and you're like, they're like, what's your company? It's like, oh, we we have an AI company. It's like ChatGPT. It's like, what's your key differentiator? Oh, ours is maximally curious compared to all of the other AIs. Ours will seek the truth. It's just it's such a ridiculous premise. It's not a differentiator at all, but it's Elon. So it's like, okay, we got to take it seriously, just as you said. Yeah, and he doesn't need, I mean, for me, a lot of this is bubbling up to a kind of one notion, and that is I believe in a wisdom of crowds. I believe in democracy. And a key component of that is no one entity or individual becomes too powerful. And I, I just think it's, we've reached a point where in addition we have such out of control income inequality that we end up with a large part of our GDP doesn't pay taxes because they're so powerful. They weaponize government. Oh, what do you know? You get a tax break in the first 10 million or 10 times your principal for a small business or venture investment. Oh, what do you know? Capital gains is much less than current income. Who registers capital gains? Rich people. I mean, it's just there's a lot of bad things in terms of economic policy and taxation. But more than anything, you have individuals who can behave irresponsibly and have enormously uh, damaging impact because they have so much fucking money. I mean, Elon can buy a $45 billion media company that was probably worth 10 and start spreading misinformation and creating all sorts of, making our discourse even more coarse than it was. And there's no downside and he can do it because he has just so much money. Um, I don't, and you, you, you know, you, you trying to make the point outline a scenario where he goes and pitches a venture capitalist. He doesn't need to pitch a venture capitalist. Yeah. And people are saying Twitter, I keep reading that Twitter's going to go bankrupt. And I thought, well, okay, if it was a normal company, it would. It's clearly, its revenue run rate right now is probably equivalent to just the interest payments on that $13 billion in debt. I got to mm-hmm. think that revenue's just crash, crashing. And the last I heard was that they estimated it crashed from $5 billion to $2 billion. I bet it's closer to one or one and a half now. And the uh, interest on that $13 billion in debt is somewhere between one and one and a half billion. So it's not a sustainable company. But here's the thing. He makes or loses a couple billion dollars a day with his holdings in Tesla. So he, if he decides to, can keep funding this thing for forever. And I can't imagine he'd take the L by uh, uh, taking into bankruptcy. I, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to predict. But, uh, you know, it, it, what it comes right down to is power corrupts. And I'm just not sure any individual should have I'm sounding like Elizabeth Warren or or Bernie Sanders. I believe in billionaires. I I don't, you know, I'd like to be one someday. But when people have a couple hundred billion dollars in wealth, I'm not sure that doesn't turn on itself and become a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Disney and Iger, I think he fucked up. I think he should have played golf and bought more cashmere sweaters. He's, He's literally the guy who signs up for another tour of Afghanistan and forgets how awful it was or that things have gotten worse since the last time he was roaming around. And... You know, he's talking about selling some broadcast assets. It's a really difficult business right now. Uh, it's good for the company. He's a thoughtful person and a grown-up, and the markets like him. Talk about Microsoft. We've got thoughts there. <laughs> um, it's in, the law, at least antitrust law, is interpreted by the judges. Uh, uh, is definitely siding with call it unbridled market forces and capitalism. Uh, Kara Swisher on my other podcast, Pivot. Do you know I have another podcast, Ed? I have mm-hmm. another podcast called Pivot. Well, well, well. Um, Anyways, no, she fine. said she said way back when that she thought just on a competitive level, she didn't understand the FTC trying to block it because she said the majority of the big game folks or a lot of them were in Japan. So yeah. you're going to get in the way of an American company trying to get more involved here. And I thought that was a valid point. Uh, also, the, the reality is I, I like Lena Khan. I wanted her to win here. I think it's inspiring that they put a young academic – uh, in this position of power, mm-hmm. uh, sh- she's done a bad job. Yeah. And and part of the FTC and the DOJ's power 
is the algebra of deterrence. And that is they can show up to a company and say, you shouldn't acquire this company or we need you to spend this. And the reason they carry a big stick is because under the threat of litigation, they're more likely than not, the company they file a suit against is going to lose. Mm -hmm. And what she's doing is racking up a series of L's where the threat of the FTC filing suit against you isn't that scary. And to be fair, uh, Congress has to do its job and pass laws that enable her to do her job. But part of her job responsibility is to assess the law as it is and decide if she, what what are, you know on a risk adjusted basis what is the likelihood that she'll get a win because without the fear of a win no one you know no one behaves or they're just more inclined to throw caution to the wind and test the legal limits of this stuff so anyways did you, sorry did did you not feel that during the tech recession from last year i mean obviously everything's back up again but didn't wasn't that sort of a signal to you personally that maybe these tech companies aren't as safe as, and secure as we'd thought? Like, you know, the fact that you had all of these companies down, what, 80%, 70%, 60 70 80%, that's sort of a signal to me that they're not, they're not completely protected. They don't have total monopoly power. They're still vulnerable. Are you as worried about monopoly power in tech as you used to be? I think it's a fair point, and that is, does the market do its job? The biggest pushback I get is that the market is a better arbiter than some, you know, angry professor with ED right. pushing government or reading <laughs> government on. And the market, in some senses, takes, you know, does punish these firms. But if you look at the real monopolies, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Google, Alphabet, yeah. okay, there was a buying opportunity. I mean, one buying opportunity does not make a healthy market. Mm -hmm. Now they've all ripped back. And look what's happening with threads. It's I'm I'm happy about threads because I don't like Elon Musk. And I think the most powerful person in the world should not be spreading, uh, you know, conspiracy theory about gay love affairs. Of the, I mean, he's just or accusing his coworkers of sex crimes or not. I mean. You're the wealthiest man in the world not paying his bills. And when someone gets fired from Twitter now, they not only aren't, aren't getting the severance they were guaranteed, they're having trouble getting COBRA insurance coverage because there's no one at HR to return their calls. I just don't think the wealthiest man in the world should be behaving that way. Having said that, what we miss is that threads, it took a monopoly to take on Elon Musk, that all of these innovative startups – yeah. Blue Sky from Dorsey, Post from Noam Bardeen, you know, Mastodon – they've kind of hit this giant windshield because they don't have this canon of 3 billion users. And there is something uncomfortable about the, you know, the monopoly and social meta shows up and boom, gets to 100 million users. That It's a larger existential question about concentration. I mean, I would love to see, I would love to see her, you know, I know there's a case about breaking up um, Google and their ad business. That strikes me as the right place to start. Maybe that's the DOJ. I can't remember. But it's, um, you know, his, his uh, threads is, it's just so weird to be rooting for Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. And I think that Twitter, I mean, I was thinking about this. We're writing a post about this for No Mercy, No Malice. Twitter is literally the largest self-inflicted wound in the history of big tech. And what do we mean by that? If Elon Musk had never downloaded the Twitter app, he'd be the, not only the most powerful person in the world, he'd be the most beloved. Because when you see him in interviews, he's more measured. He comes across as thoughtful. Um, you know, he, he comes across as a reasonable guy and his achievements just sort of speak for themselves. But unfortunately, an app that lets your id take over and, mm -hmm. and reduces all impulse control, what's happened is this app has done something terrible uh, for him, and that is it has let him reveal his true self. And his true self is he's an asshole. And people people at the end of the day, they're, I don't want to call it karma, advertisers and employees and regulators don't want to work with, cooperate, or ally with assholes. And think about if he'd never tweeted. Think about if he'd never spent $45 billion and fired six of these 8,000 people. Mm -hmm. Think about if he'd never started spreading conspiracy theory. Think about if he'd... Yeah, I mean, he, he would literally be the Jesus Christ of this generation. And now he's this very polarizing figure. 
I feel as if he has uh, people coming for him. The reason I, I don't think Meta would have launched threads if uh, it hadn't been for Elon Musk. I think yeah. they would have just left it alone. Yeah. Uh, but this is uh, the largest self-inflicted wound in the history of tech is probably the day it happened, the day that Elon Musk decided to download the Twitter app. Mm -hmm. Without, I mean, I mean, the reality is, and this is what is so mendacious about social media, when you're already powerful, you probably best just not getting on social media. You're, it, it, on a risk-adjusted basis, it probably doesn't go good places unless you have thoughtful people who can save you from yourself. And I mean, I'm getting to the point now where I'm like, okay, at some point, social media will become more of a negative than a positive for me because I say stupid things and you know, occasionally go, oh, this is a good idea to tweet while I'm on edibles. Um, <laughs> anyways, greatest self-inflicted wound in the history of big tech. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our first story. U.S. inflation fell to 3% in June. That's its largest slowdown in more than two years, down from 4% the month before. This is a huge win for Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve, who've been raising interest rates to tamper inflation since the beginning of 2022. This time last year, we were looking at more than 9% inflation. Still, inflation has not yet reached the Fed's target rate of 2%. Plus, core inflation, which doesn't include volatile food and energy costs, is proving stickier. Prices are up 4.8% from a year ago. The Fed paused rate hikes at its last meeting in June, but it's made clear that there will be further increases before the end of the year. Scott, what's your reaction to the inflation news? I think Time's person of the year will either be Zelensky or Sam Altman. Maybe it already was Zelensky. I don't know, but... Um, it should be Jerome Powell. It should be Chairman Powell. Yeah. I, I think he's been an extraordinary leader. Everyone was second guessing him. People going on CNBC who had interest rate sensitive businesses saying he was creating the Weimar Republic. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, this is a direct result of an increase in Elizabeth Warren, you know, Senator Warren, you know, going crazy about the increase in interest rates have resulted in. I mean, it, this guy's come under huge pressure, and he's just been steadfast. Mm -hmm. And now our inflation is the lowest, I think, of any OECD country. Yeah. And the, there's just not getting around it. When you have a lot of inflation, wages don't keep up with it, and people's quality of life goes way down. And he has been steadfast, and he's just ignored all the noise, looks at the data, and says, yeah, banks failing is bad. Yeah, people's mortgages and credit card bills going up is bad. Mm -hmm. You know, no doubt. There's, you know, this is a a bad decision between bad decisions, but he's like, the worst isn't runaway inflation. You can, inflation's one of those things, once it gets out of control, it is out of your control. And it's how a society and an economy can literally collapse. And he said, you know, not on my watch, girlfriend. And he implemented a series of exceptionally unprecedented and exceptionally painful interest rate increases, and it looks as if it's worked. And it's not all him. I think there's certain deflationary features. The yep. supply chain is getting ungunked. I think even even AI is probably responsible for some deflationary forces, as I think the layoffs in big tech and the prospect of AI has probably made some people not quite as confident in their salary negotiations. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a huge victory. And as usual, it prompts the following question. If you don't think the American economy is strong, where would you rather be? And so we're bringing inflation down, but we have historically low unemployment. I mean, okay, that's pretty much the Goldilocks economy right now. So yeah. I think it's amazing. You included that uh, in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach area has a 9% inflation rate, more than double the national average. I think that's because you and Claire had my credit card at the strip club 11. <laughs> I think that is... I think that's what's going that's on hard. here. That's yeah. easy two points of that nine points. <laughs> um, but look, I think this is I think this is a huge victory for the U.S. Yeah. and for and for Chairman Powell. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you think back to the conversations that we had a few months ago, where we had all of this doomerism around hyperinflation. So Jack Dorsey put out a tweet. He said hyperinflation is going to change everything. It's happening. And then we also discussed that Balaji Srinivasan bet where he bet a million dollars in March that the U.S. would enter hyperinflation within the next 90 days. Um, I just I looked up the, the definition of hyperinflation. This is what these people were predicting. Quote, rapid, excessive, out of control price increases, usually exceeding 50 percent per month or a thousand percent per year. And we were taking this stuff seriously. 
And once again, the catastrophists and the doomerists have been proven wrong. And I guess the thing that I'm feeling on this news is I hope that we remember this moment and that we mark this moment because next time, I mean, th there's going to be another period of relative instability compared to the past and compared to other nations. And I just, I, when everyone starts shouting that the Fed is corrupt and that people like Jerome Powell don't know what they're doing, they're sort of these bureaucratic idiots who are clouded by their bureaucratic backgrounds or whatever it is that makes people distrust these people. I, I just, I hope we remember that the safest, most sensible bet is almost always to trust the experts in the US government. It's like, it's just, it's the best bet that you're going to make. It's a sure way to prevent yourself from either losing a lot of money or looking really stupid. And it, it's happened once again, but I can, I'll bet that we won't mark this moment with enough appreciation for the fact that in, in the face of all of that sentiment, all of that anger and criticism, he, yeah, like you said, he, he, he was, he held steady and he believed in what he believed. And it was a mainstream macroeconomic theory, but it worked. So I, I, I hope we remember this. Well, most importantly, let's bring this back to daddy. And when I say daddy, I mean Prof G. What was my prediction about inflation? <laughs> And I think we're going to see inflation come down almost as fast as it went up. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> that it was going to come down as, as fast as it had gone up. Yep. Inflation is too many dollars facing too few products. The Fed was going to decrease the number of dollars out there. We were going to run out of stimulus money. Yeah. And China and supply chain was going to get ungunked, and we were going to see a crash in inflation, and that's what's happened. So yep. I— I think this is I think this is great. Um, the dollar has come down, which is probably a good thing. You know, depending on what side you are, it probably helps in terms of our export economy. Yeah. And uh, I'm just again, I I think I think we're right to question government, and we're able to do that at the ballot box, and our you know f free speech and uh, our great journalistic infrastructure does a pretty good job of keeping government sort of in check, sort mm -hmm. of. Yeah. And the government gets it wrong all the time, but I find generally the people, you know, Janet Yellen, uh, Chairman Powell, or Secretary Yellen, the people in government are generally some of the most talented, hardest working people. And we at some point need to bust out of this 40 year scourge or, or, or screed or whatever the term is against government started yeah. by Thatcher and Reagan that, that, you know, by virtue of being in government means you're incompetent. It's just not true. And all yeah. the, all the people going on CNBC saying we need to bring interest rates down who were funding huge projects that no longer made sense in an economy where you couldn't get free money uh, were wrong. And all these uh, – yeah, anyways, I, I'm, um, I'm very happy. Chairman Powell, Chairman Powell, I hope he's the man. I hope he's Times Person of the Year. That would be probably the best – uh, the best decision. And we are not Weimar Republic. We are not the Weimar Republic. We're the Weimaraner Republic, as in awesome. Weimaraners are awesome, Ed. Have you ever seen a Weimaraner? Do they have those in the is. UK? A Weimaraner, uh, as made famous by, I think his name was William Wegman. Uh, I actually have. My first piece of art was given to me by a friend of mine who I worked with at Profit Brand Strategy, and it was a photograph of a, he took all these photographs of Weimaraners, and they are arguably the most beautiful dog in the world, maybe with the exception mm -hmm. of a Vishla, but they are these beautiful gray hounds, but not greyhound, they're gray. Are they hounds? I think they're hounds. And they're the most gorgeous kind of mid-sized dog, and they're this incredible gray color. And this photographer just took pictures of uh, Weimaraners. Anyways, I don't know how I got here, but we <laughs> yeah. are the Weimaraner Republic, as in we are the awesome democracy <laughs> experiment country. I'm I'm very excited about this inflation number coming down. Is it, it also a, means I you, need to pay you less. It means I need to pay you less. No, I don't I just know about keep that. that in mind. Keep that in mind. <laughs> are you chalking mind. this up as a W? Like, are we well, out we'll of the see. woods? No. Okay. I mean, you could you could see it rip back. You don't. Okay. You don't want to, we don't want to declare victory. Plus their target, I think is like two, two and a half percent. Yeah, two percent. And some of it was, I guess the biggest factor was rents. Rents have come down. Yeah. Uh, which was shocking, um, but. They've um, slowed down. Or they've but, slowed down, yeah, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. But if you look at air travel, it, it, weirdly it's down 8%, like a, a literal decrease. Hmm. Which is, I can't really understand because I feel like air travel has been ripping recently. I wonder if people are running out of money. Supposedly, there was about a trillion dollars of stimulus left, and consumers were ripping through about $100 billion a month, meaning mm -hmm. that the 
the end of the party, the lights were starting to come on. It's like when they play, when I used to go out to clubs in t- the 2000s. I used to do it a lot, Ed. I used to go out a lot. I used to go out a lot. I've and heard. I'd walk in <laughs> and I'd get shitty drunk because I'm a lot more confident, a lot more likable when I'm drunk. <laughs> and and uh, at the end of the night, you know, 2 a.m. whenever it was closing, 4 a.m., they always play, <laughs> they always play Come On Eileen. That was their way of saying, Get out. They start playing bad, bad 80s music. And this feels like, <laughs> yeah, this feels, uh, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully this is the end. Mm-hmm. Hopefully this is the end of inflation. All right, let's move on to our second story. Sam Altman, the CEO and founder of OpenAI, is planning to take a nuclear reactor company public via SPAC. As a reminder, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. It's where you list a shell company on a public exchange with the intention of acquiring a private company at a later date. SPACs had their heyday two years ago, but have since declined with SPAC issuance down 96% from the first quarter of 2021 to the same time this year. Now, in Altman's case, the target company is Oclo. Oclo is a nuclear fission startup whose mission is to, quote, provide clean, reliable, affordable energy on a global scale. Altman invested in the company back in 2015, and the SPAC is expected to raise $500 million at an $850 million valuation. Now, Scott, we've discussed the decline of SPACs on this show before. Is this a signal that the SPAC market could be making a comeback? This is going to be a really interesting battle that kind of indicates or provides some insight into what are more powerful forces, both on the positive and the negative side. So mm-hmm. uh, depending on, well, let's just call them opposing forces and not assign which is positive and which is negative. On one side, you have the brand equity of Sam Altman. And going back to Times Person of the Year, whatever tech innovator, leader, aggregates more wealth in a year is has a one in three chance of being Times Person of the Year because we fetishize technology. We never put the head of a pharmaceutical company or an automobile company on the cover of Time magazine. Mm-hmm. But our tech innovators are considered geniuses because we really don't understand this shit and it's the closest thing to magic and religion we have. Of course, in addition, you have nuclear. And nuclear is finally getting, in my opinion, warranted attention and renewed interest and is having kind of a second life. If you're going to move away from fossil fuels, it feels pretty logical that nuclear has to be part of that mix. Yeah. It'll have to be a bunch of things, but uh, and then you have Bill Gates and a lot of and a lot of progress or a lot of innovation. So nuclear and Sam Altman, you know, peanut butter and chocolate, really a good tasting combo. On the other side, you have a company that is either pre revenue or very small revenues, and you have what is arguably one of the worst brands in the financial services sector, SPAC. Mm-hmm. So which of these forces is more powerful, and what will what we'll find out is sort of, you know, on the day of the offering and 30 days post the offering, is it like every other SPAC that's gone down 70, 80, 90 percent? Mm-hmm. Or is this going to give breathe new life into the SPAC market because Sam and Sam and nuclear or Suclear, Suclear, which will win here, Suclear or SPAC and um, what is it? What were the two opposing forces? SPAC pre, and pre, pre-revenue? pre-revenue. Right. So, so Spevenue. There you go. <laughs> Spevenu or Spaclier versus Spevenu. It's just going to be really interesting. <clears throat> and that and if this thing if this thing holds its value or goes up in value, I think what it's saying more maybe the larger indication or indicator will be that the animal spirits are back. That if yeah. people are willing to buy SPACs again, it means we're doing rails in the bathroom again, Ed. I mean mm-hmm. it's it's okay. Live for today. Don't worry, you know, the markets are back, baby. This is going to be really interesting uh, to follow. Yeah. Um, uh, many inside investors sold before the market turned for, you know, SPACs, as we pointed out. Um, and in 2020 and 2021, SPAC IPO proceeds were bit half of total IPO proceeds. I mean, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Branson sold three quarters of his shares in Virgin Galactic for more than $1.4 billion before cost and launch today sent the stock down. So SPAC should be called pump and dump vehicles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Chamath Palapataya, uh, head of the SPAC that took Virgin Galactic Public, sold 310 million of Virgin Galactic shares. And that's their right to sell the shares once it's public. Trevor Milton of Nicola sold about 374 million of stock for a weighted average price of about 11 bucks before he was convicted of fraud and shares dipped to a dollar a share. So this is going to be uh, this this is going to be really interesting for um, 
for a bunch of reasons. I guess the blank check company Oaklo that Sam Spac is going to give about a half a billion dollars of capital. Um, um, I'm sorry, Oaklo is the nuclear company. Mm -hmm. Sam Altman Spac is going to provide about half a billion dollars of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is going to be this is going to be um, super yeah. uh, super interesting. Also, yeah. he needs he needs. I just thought of this. I just thought of this insight. That's why I get paid the big bucks. But this will help inoculate, um, you know, be an antibiotic prophylactic against the criticism people soon fall under, and that is that these LLMs are similar to Bitcoin, consuming a massive amount of energy. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to start doing the math here that these things are warming the earth as we figure out, in the voice of Scott Galloway, please give me some some. Unbeatable pickup lines. Hello, ladies. Hello. Do you believe in love at first sight or should I walk by again? That's it. That's, that's, that's where the magic happens. That's brilliant, yeah. <laughs> How about breakfast? Should I call you or should I nudge you? That's right. You know, you'd think that with, you talked about Altman's brand. He's sort of the, the prodigal son of, of tech and AI right now. You'd think that he would be able to go raise half a billion dollars in the private markets from from vcs and you know i look at recent big rounds um in the venture ecosystem right now you know inflection ai they just raised 1.3 billion dollars humane which is that that secret ai startup that was started by these ex apple employees they raised 100 million and then you can say okay well those are ai companies but then you look at adam newman's company flow carbon which raised 350 million from andreessen horowitz wouldn't you think that he could go just raise this from from a VC? Why why is he going for a SPAC? And does the fact that he's doing that say anything about the the venture market right now? Because he's hoping the same thing that Branson and Palapatai hope that investors in SPACs are really fucking stupid and will overpay for shares in a company at a valuation that VCs with analysts who have more than an IQ of 110 and don't have the same FOMO that retail investors have. I mean, essentially, the reason you take a company public is for liquidity, to raise capital for the company, to create a publicly traded stock that you can use for acquisitions. But you're absolutely right. A guy like Sam Altman should be able to raise a lot of money in the private market. But he's decided, I can raise money to better valuation, see above stupid retail investors. And also, not, uh, retail investors, I don't mean to infantilize them, but generally speaking, the valuation you get in the public markets, because you have you know more a broader pool of investors, because the markets in the U.S. have greater regulatory scrutiny and more hurdles to go through, and typically or historically have investment banks that have tighter criteria or more stringent criteria, finer filters for taking a company public. I mean, if this thing had, you know, you really got to, you really got to kind of wonder about this thing because investment banks have no IPO volume. So if this thing had anything resembling a viable business model, Goldman and Morgan would be lined up. Goldman is taking Oddity Public, which is this kind of AI meets beauty. It's sort of the first example of a consumer product that is leveraging AI for sort of um, moisturizers and makeup and coloring that is for a, a sample set of one and takes into account your unique features and comes up with specific science-driven indications that uh, of makeup that you know make your cheekbones look better. It just it's it's like if you had the world's greatest makeup artist. When I went on as MSNBC, I'm telling you, Ed, I looked fantastic. I just looked fantastic, and it's because they have a makeup artist, a lady in a windowless room at 30 Rock, who looks at me and says, okay, this guy's pretty fucking ugly. This is going to take some time. <laughs> and she literally, no joke, she pours liquid into this weird contraption. And then she puts, you know those vests they put on you at the dentist when they're taking x-rays so you don't get leukemia yeah. when you're a little bit older? She puts a vest on me like that. <laughs> she tells everybody to stand back. And then she sprays a hose of like foundation on me. <laughs> and I remember I, when I first went on TV, like, I don't know, it was like 20, like right out of business school, like 28, I would go in and I would sit down and they kind of look at me and they'd be like, yeah, you're fine. Yeah, like, you're don't worry, you're fine. <laughs> and now it's like, stand back. <laughs> uh, anyways, but imagine you had AI such that even if you're not going on MSNBC, you're going to get the makeup you want. And they have this great brand called Il Maquillage, 
Uh, and you, so it's a cool company. It's out of Israel. They're going public. And guess who's taking them public? Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Why? Because they can. And Goldman and Morgan's management or IPO approval committee are like, okay, let's look at this business. I mean, this business, it's, it did, I think it did $220 million last year. This year it's going to do three fifty. It's going like mm-hmm. fucking crazy. It's profitable. The margins in makeup or in beauty are enormous. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of bringing in that spec. I mean, the the margins... And moats in brand equity of a beauty company with the power and scalability of technology, shama lama ding and dong, right? And this company has real. So guess what? They're not doing a SPAC. They're doing they're doing a traditional IPO. Yeah. So the the notion that that Sam couldn't get not only funding in the private market to get this $500 million, he probably could, but he'd have to give up more of the company. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Goldman or Morgan Stanley are not taking this thing public, it's just, not, it's just a negative looking yeah. forward indicator. Well, I think, I think the point that you make is the right one because it, like, it would be impossible when you have a pre-revenue company. Like I was looking at the deck of this SPAC and there are no financial forecasts anywhere. The closest thing to... A financial projection is this thing that they call illustrative unit economics, where they basically project out what cash flow might look like in 40 years. And the rest of it is these sort of hand wavy macro predictions on nuclear as a as a global market. They look at the Inflation Reduction Act and domestic production of nuclear power plants and all this stuff, uh, which is what leads me to assume, OK, this company has never made money. Um, so. I guess the point being, like, there's no way that this could ever go public via the regular process. Do you think he was unable to raise money or he's chosen not to because it, there are favorable liquidity conditions in the public markets? Well, you also mentioned this point that he could retain more of the company by going public via SPAC, which I don't totally understand if you could explain that. Well, even, okay, so he, he's got a gun to his head. He raised a SPAC. Yeah. And that is he, when the market was more right. favorable, uh, someone is talented with his brand equity, True. goes to an investment bank and says, I'm doing a SPAC. And basically a SPAC says, here's $500 million. It's a publicly traded company. And this yep. publicly traded company has one thing, a deal with you to go find an acquisition target that you think is a good company and maybe you're involved in management, maybe yeah. you aren't. Here's $500 million in this, $500 million in the stock trades at 10 bucks. And the good news for investors is before when he announces the acquisition, the owners of the SPAC get to decide whether they want to participate or they want their money back. And in the SPACs leading up to the end of 2022, you'd have redemption rates of 80, 90, 95% where everyone said, no, you're overpaying for this shitty company yeah. that no respectable investment bank would take public. We want our money back. And so then they have to go get staple on financing or debt financing and try and figure out a way to show up on closing and give the company that they're acquiring uh, the money you said you'll pay for them. And then boom, overnight, just add water. That company is a publicly traded company. So some of the things I was talking about, the dynamics of opting for the public markets, thinking you can get a better valuation, that's all true. But in this case, it's probably the He's Sam's <laughs> um, SPAC was running out of time. Because yeah. if you don't find a target within 24 months, you got to return the money and you lose yeah. you lose some money, you know, three, five, seven million bucks you spent on underwriting fees and legal fees. So he had a gun to his head. He probably found a target, Mm -hmm. probably was able to get, you know, uh, decent, mediocre terms, whatever you want to call it, and is going to put 500 million bucks in his company if he doesn't have huge redemptions and he can probably get some staple on debt financing. And then overnight, it's a public company. And it's Mm -hmm. going to be very interesting to see how the market reacts to this thing because there might be a lot of Dennis and car wash owners that go, oh, Sam Altman, chat GPT, nuclear, I'll buy the stock without looking at the numbers. And who knows, exist. maybe maybe this is the future. Maybe this company does grow into its valuation. But my, and I'm not a financial advisor, so I won't give financial advice other than don't get fucking near this thing. <laughs> right, let's move on to our third story. Private equity firms typically make headlines for buying and selling large corporations. But in the past year or so, the industry has increasingly found itself circling more modest buyout targets specifically mom-and-pop businesses. In the first quarter of 2023, small companies accounted for more than 61% of all U.S. private equity deals. That's up from 50% in 2009. 
The primary focus is Main Street economy businesses, from local plumbers and dental practices to lumberyard owners and car washers. One owner of a small alarm installation firm in Kennesaw, Georgia, said he gets as many as 30 solicitations a month. In his words, it's a nonstop barrage. Scott, private equity is the largest private asset class, $2.5 trillion in deal volume in 2022, and that was a slow year. And when I think of PE, I think of big SaaS leveraged buyouts or healthcare rollups. Why are these financial operators interested in these smaller regional businesses right now? Well, one, they have to go further down the supply chain because the kind of big private companies that were really attractive assets have been bid up to such extraordinary levels that there's sort of two types of big private company, the ones where the owners just don't ever want to be public and aren't interested and don't return their calls or yeah. they've already been purchased. So, uh, you know, there's been in a in an era or a decade of historically low interest rates, a ton of capital, there's been just a lot of acquisitions. Not, it's not to say there's still not opportunity out there. There's just the opportunity set isn't as great because you have more PE firms with more capital and the number of companies has grown, but it hasn't grown as fast as the capital. Um, and at the same time, PE is known for value add. It's smart guys, they're patient capital, they're willing to come in and invest for five, seven, ten years. And this is kind of the mother of all the whole is greater than the sum of its parts or scale play. And that is if you're a dental practice and you're doing three to five million dollars a year with three dentists, mm -hmm. you know, you're spending 10 percent on marketing, operations, technology, which um, – you know, should be five or eight percent, or even staying at ten percent, just be much more effective. And you don't have someone in your office who really knows how to optimize the shit out of Google, or doesn't know can't purchase software or CRM packages in bulk, or can't negotiate with suppliers, or or maybe doesn't have best practices around patient management or revenue optimization or new technologies. So, you if you roll up. You know, uh, there's small kind of dental practices with two or three. My dentist or my old dentist in, in Delray was a guy named Craig Spodak, and he had this amazing operation. And like most dentists, his dad was a dentist, and he heard the company works really hard. Ton of innovation. I would bet he does, I don't know, 15, 15 to $30 million. It's a big operation. Mm. And the PE guys come in and say, okay, if we roll this up, if we get enough scale, one, we can access the public markets. And a private practice like that trades at maybe five to eight times EBITDA. But if we get this public, it trades at 12 times. So there's, yep. it's accretive there. And two, we're going to take, you know, 20 of these acquisitions that equal two or 300 million. And we're going to centralize a lot of things that you're not great at. You're great at, you're great at dentistry. You're great at relationship management. You're great at marketing in the local area, but technology, operations, negotiating with suppliers. Mm -hmm. HR practices, we're gonna we're gonna create one back end across everybody and and for less money or lower percentage of your revenues, do a better job. Mm -hmm. And then we might be able to access the public markets or another private equity buyer that doesn't want to buy a twenty or thirty million dollar dental practice, but loves the idea of buying ten or twenty of these things that are doing three hundred million and growing eight or ten percent a year. That's a nice company. It's not dissimilar from what kind of Martin Sorrell pioneered in the 80s when he went around and bought all of these services firms known as ad agencies and smoothed out the variability and created a lot of synergy on the back end around operations mm -hmm. and realized that the key was the relationships that these individual agencies had with clients, but the back end, some of the access to capital, HR, infrastructure, whatever it is, and also smoothing out the variability of an individual practice created um, an investment, created assets that were now investment grade, which before were just small businesses. And they're doing this across a bunch of fragmented industries. I think you yeah. mentioned car washes and plumbing, but this makes a lot of sense. And I think there's been some big successes here. It's good for the dentist. He or she gets uh, possibly access to some liquidity and maybe an increase in the value of, the mark of, of their practice because they have now you know, three or five percent of a of a bigger asset that might go public. They get operational help. They get business advice. So, you know, this is an example of capitalism at work. I I don't imagine there aren't you know some horror stories where they guys sell these things and they hate the company and they right. never get the liquidity they'd hope. And they also give up some control because they're no longer kind of in charge, if you will. 
But I think this is a super interesting strategy, and um, I'm, I'm gonna, I think you're going to see it across multiple uh, industries. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the notion that these private equity firms are actually net negative in terms of value added? Because, I mean, private equity just as an industry has received so much criticism in the past, particularly from people on the left. I mean, we mentioned Elizabeth Warren earlier in this episode. She's described them as vampires, particularly because of this dynamic where the PE firm will go to a a distressed company, they'll load them up with debt. And then, you know, whether or not the company succeeds, maybe it goes into bankruptcy, but the firm still ends up fine because it's taking its 2% in management fees. And then in addition to that, there's this other, you know, truthful trope, which is that the main strategy across most PE firms is just laying people off. And Mia had this interesting data point, which is that the average PE acquired company has a 13% headcount reduction two years after the buyout. Um, so do you think that there's a possibility? I, and by the way, I agree with all everything you said in terms of value add. But do you think that there's a possibility that this secular shift into Main Street economy, mom and pop businesses could harm those businesses um, and in addition, substantially reduce employment opportunities on Main Street. Yeah, I think that's mostly bullshit. I, I, look, okay. <laughs> I, private equity is an asset class where these individuals have raised a lot of capital. The majority, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who sold to private equity. Yeah. And the majority of those entrepreneurs like their partners. That's how they refer to them. And they got a bunch of money and they de-risked and they took a bunch of money off the table and they still kept a big interest in the new, you know, part of a larger entity. And if a private equity firm borrows enough money and goes into default on it, uh, they're not going to be able to raise more money. So the notion that their play is just to to l- <laughs> yeah. l- lay tons of debt on the thing and then declare just bankruptcy fail, and yeah. move on to the next thing, that just, <laughs> that's just not true. Their strategy is to come into a company, grow it or cut costs or both, and then take it public or sell it for more money based on business improvement. In terms of coming in and laying off employees – Look, I, I think capitalism is about applying capital to its greatest use. And if a company can be run at the same level of profit with uh, lower employment, uh, you know that is going to happen. It's just a question of when it happens. And I would argue it's better to do it sooner rather than later. Now, having said that, having said that, uh, I think private equity firms, sh- uh, you know, uh, have weaponized government, pay lower taxes. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, I hope someday someone loves me as much as Senator Cinema loves private equity. And they get to pay essentially uh, long-term capital gains or lower taxes on what is a commission. They get a 20% carried interest, which is commission. Whereas yeah. if I sell copiers, the commission I get is taxable at a higher rate. So the wealthiest people in America, private equity players, pay lower taxes. That makes no fucking sense. You know, I would like to see... Uh, you know, I, I think there's all sorts of things that are screwed up about the system as it relates to private equity players. But private equity is a mechanism for buying companies. And there's two sides of this trade. The current owners of the business don't have to sell the business to private equity if they don't yep. want to. If they really think they're evil and are going to lay off their employees, you don't have to sell. Okay. And And the people who buy that debt that finances the takeout are buying that debt knowing full well what is the likelihood they yeah. will default and they get an interest rate or return on their investment commensurate with that. And people want to buy fixed income mm-hmm. and get a basket of private equity uh, company debt that trades at a higher yield, recognizing some will go under, most will not, and they get returns such that they can continue to take their kids to Disneyland. It just This is all, this is part of capitalism. If Senator Warren really wants to add value, she should do her fucking job and raise taxes on on the wealthy instead of just – she's the referee that complains about the game and she's wearing right. a fucking referee's jersey. Then raise taxes. Anyways, I, these, these far-left senators who want to demonize private equity and billionaires and tax rates, it's like, well, OK, it's too bad we don't have senators who can restore equity to our tax structure. Oh, that's you, mm-hmm. Senator. That's you. They controlled, we Democrats controlled all three houses, the White House, Congress, and Senate, and we still couldn't figure out a way to increase the taxes of the wealthiest people in the world. We still couldn't figure out a way for the wealthy not to weaponize tax loopholes. We still couldn't figure out a way to not have Kristen 
cinema center cinema like literally bend us over in exchange for a million dollars in donations from private equity people in a state that does not register any benefit from private equity arizona <laughs> so yeah i agree senator warren you haven't done your fucking job and the result is a series of companies and wealthy people who are not paying their fair share but you know don't player don't hate the player hate the game don't hate the game hate the person that makes the rules and is the referee of the game, and that's our leadership. What a rant, Ed. (laughs) What a rant. That's it. That's it. This brand of meth is the right brand, whatever I'm on right now. Anyways. Okay. I forget where we were. Where am I? We're we're, we're wrapping it up now, so let's move on. Uh, Before we get to the week ahead and your prediction, Scott, let's listen to the prediction you made exactly one year ago in our very first Markets episode. My prediction, and I have been wrong. Anytime I use the word Tesla, I'm usually wrong. This company is still the most overvalued company in the world, and the market is looking for an excuse to take this company to the woodshed. And I think it's going to find it in China, specifically production problems in China, and the fact that the CEO is doing pretty much everything but anything to do with Tesla, he's managed to piss off the far left by saying that the Democratic Party is hateful, and he's also managed to piss off the spokesperson for the right, Donald Trump. So I think all of this is going to take a toll, and at some point, every stock here is getting beaten up pretty badly. And Tesla is actually held up; it's down thirty or forty percent. So my prediction, my prediction, and again, don't trade on this because I usually get it wrong about Tesla. Pain. That's not fair. That's not that's not that's not loving, Ed. <laughs> well, actually, it is because I mean, well, okay, let's what make happened? the argument for you, which yeah. is it got cut in half six months later. Yeah, but then it came yeah. back, so it's it's back around where it was when I, I made mean, the prediction. Yeah. A year ago, is at two forty. December, it's down to close to a hundred, so more than cut in half. And you didn't bring up the prediction when it was down at a hundred, did you? I, yeah, I bet we did. I bet you don't. So remember. I was very right, and now I'm just <laughs> meh. I was very right, and now I'm meh. Yeah, my emotion, I, I, my emotion clouds me here. I don't. I have trouble. I can't see clearly. I thought CoinDesk was going to zero, and CoinDesk has been ripping. Coin, yeah. Coinbase. I'm sorry, Coinbase. Yeah. yeah, CoinDesk, Coinbase, Coinage, Coin the term. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I got, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Are we gonna do this every week? We're gonna revisit our predictions. Hell yeah. Ah, I like that. Hold I like that. Accountable. Hold you accountable. Okay, um, so are we looking for another prediction? Is this a setup? Yeah, well, so first let's take a look at the week ahead, which is we're going to see earnings from Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Charles Schwab, Netflix, and Tesla. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But yeah, let's let's hear another prediction. Uh, okay, my prediction is uh, the next kind of IPO, uh, I think that is going to, uh, reinforce the notion that the IPO market is coming back is this firm called Oddity. It's an Israeli-based beauty company. Mm-hmm. Uh, the numbers look fantastic. And I just love the peanut butter and chocolate combination of a consumer company with great brands that integrates well with technology, specifically kind of AI-driven uh, mass customization. I think Goldman and Morgan are taking this thing out. And um, uh, I forget what the... I, they're going to raise, I think, about three hundred million bucks at a valuation of. Oh shit, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think this thing's going to get a pop. I think this is the. I think this has a lot going for it. It's a well-run company. I think the Goldman and Morgan brands give people the kind of I don't know certainty that somebody's actually home and done their homework, as opposed to CNBC, who lets any Joey bag of donuts come on and talk about their SPAC. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the market is hungry for a consumer branded IPO. And then again, sprinkle on that AI like seasoning. And, you know, uh, I think it's going to do really well. So, my prediction Oddity uh, has a fantastic first day opening market uh, when it, when it um, prices. And I, don't, I think it's pricing either later in the month or early August. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday. And we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.